Okay, so we have the microphone back. So good morning, everyone. Today is the second um, lecture for our course uh, 1022, mobile programming. So if you didn't attend the, the first lectures, we discussed more about administrative issues, about the lab, the grading schemes. The lecture is already on the course model. Did anyone still have no access to the course model? If you are officially enrolled, you will have access. If you are not enrolled officially, you still need to wait until you are officially enrolled in the class so you can access the Moodle. The lecture slides are posted on the course Moodle. So we will continue today discussing the topics just to remind you about the previous lectures. Previous lecture we discussed what is Android operating systems and why we need the Android operating systems and how the Android operating system is built. And also we covered some issues about Android Studio. Android Studio is the IDE that you're going to use in the labs. So it's good to be familiar with Android Studio. There is a lot of tutorials available. Um, early in my days, I used to go to the library where I can find a reference book from the library where I can read more information. Nowadays, I think everybody have access to the internet either through the cell phones or through the laptops. So you can go to the YouTube or ask Google about Android Studio. You will have a huge amount of tutorials and information. Now, the course is designed in such a way we're going to teach you Java programming. Some of you, they have some basic Java programming. We're going to improve programming skills, but we're going to use the Android Studio that allow us to develop a small app for a smartphone. Now, at the end of this course, it's expected you know how to use Android Studio, how to develop a small app, but this is not our main, main objectives. Our main objective is to teach you how you can approach any problem in terms of programming. You know that in mathematics, if I give you integrations or differentiations or addition or subtraction, you're going to have pencil and paper and try to solve this integration or this dif differentiation. Now, I will give you the problem, and I would like you to use the Java concept to solve this and end up by creating a class or method inside this class so you can solve this problem. Now, as you can see, some people, they can learn programming using pencil and paper, but we are insisting that you're going to use the computer to solve programming. So one of the things is to be familiar with the lab environment. So attending the lab is important. And again, I'm going to make this clear. You have to attend the section that you are enrolled with. So if you have a conflict with the class, the time of the lectures, the time of the lab, you should, as, as not, I cannot solve anything. It's from the registration where you register the course. You have to solve any conflict in your schedule. So you are available to attend the lectures. It's very important. And you're also available to attend the lab. Because once you finish the lab, you have to demonstrate to the TA that this app is working on the department real Android device. There is a tablet attached to the computers where you're going to run your app. You cannot run your app in you using your laptops or using a virtual Android device. You have to run the app on the real device that exists in the lab. And then the TA will give you a grade out of four. We have five labs. Each lab works for four grades. Now, you have to work on the partners. You have to find a friend on the same section you are rolled with. You cannot cross sections. Team cross section is not acceptable. So you have to attend, for example, Wednesday section one, and you have to find a friend where you can work together during all the semesters. Uh, we discuss 
about Android Studio terminology. And today we're going to do something also about Android terminology. How to save your work. I encourage all of you to see the slides. It's just the steps how you can save your work. Let's say I attend the lab and I already demonstrate lab one in the front of the TA. I got the grade. Now I have to submit my work individually to the system. So the system is called Web Submit. We can upload the app. Not a complete app, just the necessary files. I'm going to show you some steps today about that, but everything is on the slide on the lecture number one. Now, today we will discuss, I hope we can cover everything, but in case if we couldn't cover everything, we can catch next lecture. So we're going to see how we can create the app interface using XML file and using interface tags. We're going to see what we mean by model view control, which is the new design pattern nowadays. And many of software engineering or any programmer develop this scheme to approach any problem by dividing it in the model path, the view path, then the control path, which is make it easy for them to focus on a some component, module component, and optimize the view, then go to the model, optimize the model, then they implement the control where it's communicate between the model and the view. And hopefully after we discuss the model of view control, we're going to go over Java basics and how the program organized inside the Java. Some of you, they already have some preliminary information about that, but we will try to highlight it to make it more consistent for everyone. So in case if you don't know how the Java program is organized, we're going to also show you how the Java program organized. We're going to discuss some Java basic keywords and data type. It's very important to implement or a program in any programming language to know how you can declare a data type, how you can declare a variable, identifiers, and what type of this identifiers. And also, we're going to see how the data type converges between each other. So we'll start about how to build the design app. This slide from the previous lecture, but unfortunately, we couldn't uh, cover all of this. So in each app, you will see what we call activity underscore main dot XML. What's the purpose of this activity underscore main dot XML? In the new version of Android Studio, you don't have any choice to rename this one while you are creating your app. But in the old version or the version that exists on the lab computers, you will be able to, let's say, activity underscore zero or you give any name you like. Then you have the palette on the left side where you can drag and drop the items in your view. I will keep the slide. I will switch, try to switch here to the demo. So hopefully on this LCD, you will see quickly how this is happening. So now this is the Android Studio where you have the choice to see all the existing apps that we create or you work on, Lab 1, Lab 2, Lab 3, or any other apps you like. For example, this is 01 we created last time. You can open the existing lab in your workspace. Or you can even sometimes import some Android code samples from Google uh, to work with. I told you last time that before Android Studio, people used to have clips and they have to install some add-ons. So even Android Studio gives you the capability to bring an old version app that you develop using clips and import it to Android Studio. But you have to keep in your mind that Android Studio, uh, I mean, Clips is no longer maintained. So nobody is using a Clips anymore to develop the app. But in case if you come across some app, already very old programming app, 
use clips, still you can bring that app if you like and integrate it with Android Studio. Now let's go back to the app we worked together last lectures. Now you can see here, this is the structures of the, on this side, this is the structures of the app folder. I can change the view from the project view to the Android view and they have a different uh, view. So you can see most time you're going to use the Android view. And under the Android view you can see there is a manifest XML file which is contains most of the controls that we use once we run the app. And also there is a Java folder where you have the Java classes. And we have the Android test which is used once you develop your app you need to put any test scenario uh, simulate the end user scenario interacting with your app or you have the JUnit test we're going to cover this on the class later on how we can create the JUnit test and we will integrate it on the test folder. Resources folders will contain many information about the resource we used during developing of this app. Figures, string conversions, multi-language, all of these information, colors, styles, all of these is part of the resources. Layout is considered one of the resources and as you can see this is a resources activity underscore zero dot XML. Now once you open this you have two sides here on the bottom, the tabs. And these tabs either to see the design view or you can see the text view. In the text view as you can see here it's a pure XML file. This is XML file, it start with the tags, buttons, and end the tags. And all of these values or attributes you can call associated with this tag. All these attributes are gonna contribute to the view of this buttons on the tab. So, back to the computer, you can see the slide where we can go over this quickly. So we have two ways. The first one which is the SDK development of the app we're not going to cover in this lectures or in this course. So we're going to go to XML option number two where we're going to use tags to design the view for the apps. So Whenever you are starting with any project, as you can see here, you will have the view of the project and there is one display on the screen which is called Hello World. This one is just the startup. You can delete it and you can start. This is the view palette and these are the component tree and here is the parameter or attribute associated with this view. As you can see, this view text is uh, selected so all these attribute is associated with this one so this is the XML this is the style design or you can go to the text this is the tree where the text view is selected and this is the text view inside the view now all the properties of the view is shown to the left side you can switch between some selected or recommended from Android Studio attribute to the main or all the attribute by pressing these two arrow side arrow on the left side so you can switch between the recommended or selected list to all probabilities or all attribute list by clicking to this double arrow now once you select the layout, as we discussed last time, we have different layout, different constraints. When you design your app, you want them to be vertically aligned or you want them horizontally aligned. You can put a layout inside another layout to organize your view, user interface items. So once we select the layout, as you can see these attributes here, they are in terms of the width and the height, they are match the parent which means they are matching actually the width and the height of Android device. Whenever I run the app on any different 
Android device with different height and width, this layout will match the height and width of the given Android device. Now, you can see here, we have selected the text view, and these are some attributes like text inside the text view is hello world, and also you can see the constraint of this to the four sides, from the top and bottom to the left and right. Now, all these it can be manipulated directly using this simple view here, and you can manipulate all these constraints. You can make this to the left or right or to the bottom. And you can see also there is an ID given to any user interface item you add to your view. This is the corresponding HTML, uh, sorry, XML file to this view. As you can see, it's already constrained. And if we read the XML together, you can see there is no ID given to this text view right now. The only thing is you can see here the width and the height are actually the wrap the content. So the width and the height of this text view is going to match the content. But in terms of the layout constraint, as you can see, it's only matching the fair ones from the top and the to left to right and to buttons. The text inside it is hello world. So I would like you, whenever you look at the XML, you can have some, develop some intuition about what is going on on the really design view. Every Android XML is going to start, as you can see, with the tag and closing the tags at the end. And this type of the tag is Android.support.constraint.constraint layout. We open the tag, and then we provide all the attributes, and we put in inside this constraint some view. And we end the tag by backslash, sorry, forward slash, to close the Android support constraint layout. This is the beginning of the tag for the text view, and this is the end. And all the ones inside, as you can see, is attribute associated with this text view. Now, let's say we just added this text view to the design for our app. We just drag drop text view to this view. And as you can see here, there is nothing constrained for this what is the ID? The ID is text view also. So we can see the XML corresponding to the previous text view. There is no thing much information here. You see the ID, Android, colon, ID. Every user interface item you add to the view has a unique ID because we're going to use that later on on the Java programming to catch up the content or display some content to this text view. So every ID you add to the view will have some ID. In this case, the ID is text view. We're going to see some apps where the ID is some meaningful ID where we can use. But the, right now, for just to illustrate the corresponding between the design view and the XML view. You can see the width and the height is really fixed to 125 dp and the height to 43 dp. The text inside it is the text view, the tools and editors for that it's an absolute position. So that means this text view is actually at this location. Doesn't matter if you run it with a tablet or different Android devices, it will stay at this specific absolute location. Now let us try to change this by just constraint to the top and see the corresponding effect to the XML. So as you can see, the change here on the top, it becomes the parent. So everything is the same except that now the text view is attached to the top of the parent which is the layout in this case. Now, this is the layout margin. It's 38. 
the layout margin between this fixed view and the pair one, in this case, the constraint layout. Let's go over the XML file and interface some tags. So each XML file gonna be correspond to tree of elements. As you can see, we have the constraint layout. Inside it, there is a user interface items, and each one of them is a widget or a view we can use. Now, attribute of XML elements are properties, and describe how the widgets will be appear on the text view. For example, if we have Android colon text style equal between two double quotation bold on the buttons, which means the buttons will be bold. Let me go back to the view to demonstrate this for you. So here, this is the, the view. I can zoom in to the view. I can delete this one, for example, the drag, drop the buttons on the middle. As you can see, this buttons is not constrained to the left or to the right or to the buttons or the top. I can constrain this button. I can give an ID. I can say this is button A, capital, or I can give any different name just for the purpose of demonstration. We're going to keep it like this. Now, as you can see here on the right side, this we can make a constraint to this, to the up, to the buttons, and to the left, to the right. And these are the margins. And there is an immediate effect of this on the XML file. I can go back to the design. I can change the text inside the button. I can change the style, the size of the text. I can make it bold, italic. I can do all these attributes and every attribute I'm going to do it on the, this view, it has an effect on the XML file. You can see the size, bold and italic in terms of the styles, the margin to the top, the margin at the end, the width and the height, which is match the content of the button, the constraints that I'm at. The only thing that you need always to remember, whenever I'm going to do any click or drag and drop anything to the view, design view, it will have a corresponding effect on the XML. We need you to know most of this. OK? I can change the background colors. I can change the text colors here, 0, 0. This has become a blue. We will discuss this on the slides. So I'll go back to the slides. So all the XML come like a namespace. Take all the attributes from the XML NS to the Android Studio from Android HTTP schemes go to android.com.apk resources Android. All of them is inherited. All the items will be our children of this namespace. Now, it's important to recognize your view or user interface ID that you add to the design by give an ID, a meaningful ID. Because later on, when you come to the Java programming, you need to grab the content or attribute of this ID. So that's why we are focusing on the Android colon ID, to give a meaningful ID for each user interface item we added to the view. Here is an example. 
you can see we have the button with an ID standard button. And even if you didn't change the ID, the Android Studio will make sure that any user interface you add to the design has a unique ID. So once we add a first button, it will be button. The second one will be two, three, four, up to the end, if you didn't pay attention to the ID. And you can see here that some attributes belong to this button, the ID. And these are just a list, just a brief list about some Android Studio XML tags that we gonna go over or you're gonna use it during the development of your labs. Now, one of the things that is good to highlight here is the gravity. Android Studio Gravity and Android Layout Gravity. So even for each user interface, there is a gravity, either to be a center, to the left, to the right, to the bottom or to the top. But also there is a style that belongs to every user interface you add to inside this constraint. So they have a gravity at the constraint level, and you have the gravity at each user item level. Now, the user item override the one in the top. If the gravity is missing at the user, that means we're gonna follow the layout gravity. Now, each user interface you add, you can play with the color attribute, either the background color, the text color for this user interface item. One of the things is you need to know that the color scheme is used by Android Studio is called red, green, blue. So each one, we have three numbers. And for the green, for red, green, and blue. The first one represents how much you need from the green, how much you need from the sorry, red, then green, then blue. And these numbers range from 00, zero up to FF, which is the hex, using the hex. So, as you can see on this table, if you need the intensity of the red to be 255, and the intensity of the green is zero, and the intensity for the blue is zero, that means you are really looking for a red color. If you need the intensity for the zero for the red, zero for the green, and 255. When I say 255, that means I FF. So, zero, 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 FF then you will looking for blue. If all the intensity are zero, that means you are looking for a black. If all the intensity are F, 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 that means you are looking for a white. And these are some values correspond to each color. So if you need a white, that's what we said, you have six Fs, that means you are looking for a white background or a white color for the text. If I have FF000, that means I'm looking for red, silver, with C0, C0, C0. These are some common colors that you might use during the development of your apps. Now, if I told you to look at these XML tags and have some intuitions about how the buttons will look like. So, in terms of the background color, it will be 000. zero, zero. That means the background color will be black. Because I need zero intensity from all the three colors. And what is the text written on the buttons? Zero. And what is the color of this text? White. So as you can see, the background is black and the text is white. And this is the button. Now, this is yellow. I need full intensity from the red, full intensity from the green. Both together we're going to create yellow. And I need red for the text. And the text will be one. So this is the view of the text. So as you can see, we can read the XML file and then have some kind of preliminary understanding how this button will look like 
when I run the app. What about this? What is the color of the background? Black. And what do you think about the text color? Green. So this is the now for any most time when you are working with the buttons user interface you're going to be interested on these mainly mainly three attributes android id android on click whenever you click this buttons what kind of functions on the java code you need to perform what kind of task you need this button to perform so this is become on the Android colon on click to interact with the user and also Android colon text which is the caption on the top of the buttons. As you can see here this is just for you to see how you can grab the ID of the buttons inside your Java. You can ask find the view by ID. This is a method developed by Android Studio Expert, you can use it. And you have to give a specific ID to grab some veterans attributes. So you can work with it. And here is the resources, ID, the ID, R represent the resources. You go to the resources, ID, ID space, and you fit a specific veterans ID, which is the ID of your veterans and then you cast it to buttons and assign it to P, a variable or an object of type buttons. We're going to go over this next lectures too. So as you can see here, this is the style for the XML for a button A that we define and the width and height is wrapped the content. So it's going to wrap the content of this button and the text is push. The method that we're going to call is on a click buttons method. Whenever this method, this button is clicked, we're going to go to the Java, look for this method, and execute it. All these are very important tags. You need to understand the behavior of these tags to the view. So if I give you this button, and I ask you, fill the blanks here. This is one of the questions on the lab test, maybe one you're going to see. I give you the view, as you can see here. And I ask you to fill the blanks. Fill the background, fill the text, and fill the text color, and what is the style. Take half a minute and write it down, and let us see your answer. Based on our previous discussion, I hope some of you will be able to answer this. Yes. Let's give the other students half a minute. Good. You're going to see questions like this during the lectures, OK? And most of the time, questions like this will also be repeated on the lab test, OK? So what is the background? OK. And when we give you a question on the lab test, we're going to give you a, a short answer. So if some students answer a number sign 000, zero, zero without the double quotation, we should give him a full mark, or we should give him a partial, or give him a zero. We should give him a zero, because this is a programming. It's not about what I'm intending to do. If I put 
zero, zero, zero without double quotation on the Android Studio, Android Studio will not be executed. Okay? So the double quotation is part of your answers. Unless, if we tell you on the lab test, don't pay attention to double quotation, just give me your answer. But if I give you a question where I'm asking you to give me a precise answer, so please give me a precise answer as you are in the front of the machine. So I need double quotation. Yes. Yes, yes, yeah. No, during the lab test, you will have access to the Android Studio. So there is no excuse. During the lab test, you will have access to the Android Studio. You can open Android Studio and try to create this pattern and see. Okay? So I'm not going to make you complete blind to memorize everything. No, you're going to memorize a little bit. Okay? But you have access to the programming tool during the lab test. How do you know? How do you know? If you practice, you know. If you look now, without practicing, it's very hard to tell if this is a ball will be or not. But if you practice on creating views, by looking to it, you will understand that designer make it blue or italics. Okay? So it's very hard just after two lectures, maybe some of you already did some steps toward finalizing app zero. And the labs start this week. So I encourage all of you to attend the lab, do practice even off the lab. So if you practice, it becomes easy for you to recognize this is italics, what the kind of the color, and this is bold or not. Yes, we are not, not Max? Yeah. Yeah, yes, I think. <laughs> exactly, yes. That's the type, I will check that. Thank you. If you work with an edit text where you need the user to interact with your app, so most likely you're going to come across these attribute, these XML attributes. It's good to understand what these attributes mean. The ID is the same. The type, if you want the user to enter the date on this text field, edit text, or you need the number without decimal point, or you need a fraction number with a decimal point, you need the size, you need, for example, the maximum number of lines where the user can enter in this text field. So at the end of the app one, you will see something like this and you need you use the text edit text because you need the weight and the height of a person to calculate or compute BMI. Now if nobody asked this question but I will answer it. In terms of the apps we don't need you to implement the exercises. We need you to implement only the app. And if you look at the textbook, this is the textbook. It's a required textbook. So you don't need to follow the answer the exercises. The only thing you need to do is the main app. OK? Now, some of you will ask, then why we have an exercises? These exercises for me to ask you in the lab test. So I'm going to pick some exercises, just refine it a little bit, and I will give it back to you in the lab test. Now, for the students who just develop the app, they will get four marks. For the students who go beyond the app and practice by themselves or back practice with their partner to implement these exercises, is not required for the lab. You already got your four marks. But for me, to see who is actually go beyond. Some of these exercises will be taken and given to you during the lab test. So I'm trying to give you all the hints so you can score good grades. Okay? So this is the XML view. 
any questions up to this point? So I tried my best up to this point to cover most of the Android Studio. So if you are still afraid of working with Android Studio, I hope you go back to the lecture notes one and two, go to the textbook. If you're still not satisfied, see some tutorials online, how you work with XML or work with Android Studio. No, there's no extra grade. The only thing this exercise is for you, to enrich your skills, to learn more about the apps, okay? Yeah. No, you have to do the, the same, it's written on the, on the textbook. Because as a software engineer, you have a contract between you and the end user or the customer you work with. The end user or the customer is already written all the requirements on the textbook. So you have to follow the textbook and develop the app exactly in terms of the colors, in terms of the size, in terms of the layout, okay? So all this constraint or requirement is a contract between you and the TA. So the TA are expecting you to follow the textbook and develop the app exactly the same. Any other questions? So now we come to the, what we call a model view control design pattern. You're gonna, I'm going to show you what do we mean by model view control pattern, design pattern. And you're going to use this while you are working on your apps. And also, you can use it beyond this course. Beyond this course, when you are working with 2030, or working with data structures, or any other programming course, or a software engineering, you're going to use this design pattern. Because this design pattern is not limited for developing the app. It's for all the software engineers. Now, whenever you come across any problem, try to think on term, I need to develop a model, modules for the control, modules for the view, modules for the model. Now. You see the problem and you try to decoupling this. Make the data, make the representation far away from each other. You try to see how I can model the data and then model the representation separately. Separate the user interface from other parts of the system. What exactly I need from the end user? I develop a system where I'm going to interact with the user. What exactly the interaction between me and the user, between my apps and the user? And this will make it easy for you in terms of development. If you go back to early, this is exactly what happened. When you are using only, there's no user interface items, there is no GUI interfaces, just console is going to input, do some processing, and print out to the console. So this kind of concept is coming back again to the model of view control. So you have the GUI interface items that's shown on your apps. And you have the control going to receive this and listen to the users when the user click or the user enter something and send the information to the model, do some processing, and retain the data back to the view. At the restaurants, we are actually using this model. You're going to see the menu as a user interface. You pick your meal. You send it to the waitress. And he will take it out from you. Then go to the kitchen, see the chef there prepare the meal, and retain it back to you, to the table. So this is the, me the menu are the view, the waiter is the controls, and the chef is the model where all the ingredients is there on the kitchen. You're going to prepare them all to sort out the meal. And you can consider the table also as a part of the view where the meal is in there. So th really, this is actually happening in our real life, model of view controls. Now. We are intending to make things separated. So what we mean by the model? Whenever you need a data, business logic, rules, strategies, you need them, you just put them in the model. The model in the Java programming will contain classes. These classes will create an object from these classes. All this will be inside the model. The model manages the behavior and the data in the application domain. Behavior we mean by that? 
the methods inside the class. The data is attribute of this class. We're going to come across that. And sometimes the model will talk to the data source. If you have some database, for example, image folders that is stored in your phone, the app will communicate with the image, communicate with the contents list inside the data source, and fetch the required data and present it back to the view, or store something on the data source. The view display the model state. What is the current state of the model? What's the current attribute and the value of the model will be viewed by the component inside the view. The view manage the graphical interface. So if you are drawing something or you're putting something, you're going to ask, uh, should I use blue or red? This is the task you answer on the view. I should put it to the corners, to the buttons or the front. All these questions, should this item be a drop list or radio buttons, whatever, all these kind of views, questions you can answer. If you are using the, con now the control is trying to listen to the users and see what kind of activity the end user is doing and communicate with the model and also communicate back to the view. So the control will interrupt any interpret anything, mouse click, keyboard, you have a tablet app, okay, and also will control the flow of information between the view and the model. So the controller will listen. Should I change the model state or not based on the user interface? And for example, the user hit some buttons. Should I bring some data from the model and present it to the view? So this is the control model view control. The role of the control is listen for the user to change the data or the state in the model and user interface and notify the model whenever it's needed to do that. Some of the model responsibility, just to summarize, provide access to the state of the model system, provide access to the system functionality or any data source, and can notify the view about the changing of the state. Some of the view responsibility display the state of the model, and at some point, okay, we're going to see that the views as an observers who are going to notify the model whenever it's a change. And also some of the control responsibility accept the user input from the buttons clicking or key pressing or slide bar or changing, send the message to the model and also try to notify the view. And send appropriate messages to the view in the Java, these controls are part of the what we call a listener. So listeners, they are listen to end user interactions. This is a we're gonna see the example of user model view. You can see here you are as an browser, you're gonna type the HTML request. It's going to go to the control of the browser and then send this request parameters to the model, prepare the data, return it to the controls, and then control, see the result, how they're going to prepare the HTML page on the view, generate the HTML view, retain the GUI interface content to the control, the control will retain back the HTTP request to you. If you see the top view of the model view control, the user interact with the view, pass some calls to the controls, and the control pass some manipulation calls to the model, and then it will fire some event that will affect the view. Some benefit of using the model view control, it's easy to implement and maintain, because you divide everything in module, and each one will you can manipulate it separately. Organize the code. So whenever you have some bugs or some problems in your code, you know that this is a responsibility of the view. 
So you focus on the view modules and you fetch it out. This is what we call about modularity, is changing one does not affect the others. So if you are working on the model, you're not working on the view or control, nothing's changed. The only thing you focus on the model. And you can develop things on parallel, and that make it easy for development to build an app. Any questions about model, view, control? So whenever you come across the apps in the lab, you just see what kind of component that I need to build for the view, what kind of component I need to build for the model. In our course, the model will be consist of classes and objects from these classes, methods, attributes belong to the classes. This is the model state. On the apps, you're going to work with the attributes of user interface on a click, on a slide, on movement, maybe when you rotate your phone, all these are going to trigger some controls, going to communicate with the model and change the view contents. Any question? So let us start now. The third topic is about Java basics and organization of Java programming. We're going to try to cover what is the packages, classes, fields, and methods. Now, one of the things that when you work with the Java basics, you have the general purpose language and where you can write the code only once and you can run it anywhere. So you write the code, hello.java, you compile the code, you generate the class, hello class. This will generate what we call a byte code. The byte code can run on any Java virtual machine. So you can take this byte code and run it on any virtual machine that is contains Java. So you install the Java virtual machine on any machine. You develop using Linux, Java, you take the program, byte code, and you run it on the Windows environment. That's why you code only once and you run anywhere using the byte code that gonna run on the top of Java virtual machine. Now, but in the Android, the Java virtual machine, the standard one for a general purpose, we not using it. We are using Delphi, Java virtual machine. This is very optimized Java virtual machine contains all the Android SDK that you need while you are developing your app. So you don't need to import too many packages. So already done for us. So this is a clean room, you can say, to develop an app. So we write the Java on the app. We're going to compile it to the class where we can uh, translate it to the EX that can run on the Delvic virtual machine. So this way, we are running the app. So if you are think that I'm going to work with the Java in 2030, you're going to run on the standard Java virtual machine in the course later on. But in this course, we're going to use a Delvic virtual machine that is integrated already on the Android Studio. So you're not going to go separately to run your program. So once you develop your app using Android Studio, it Android Studio is already going to run this for you on the Delvic virtual machine. Now, any Java programming will start with a class. That is the thing. If you have experience with other programming languages, you can see that other programming languages, you can create a method separately without putting this method inside the class. But in Java, there is no way you declare a variable you declare an object outside of the class. Everything should be within the class. Now, to do anything, you have to declare a class. Keep this in your mind. If, you, if this is your first time working with Java, you have to understand you cannot do anything without creating a class. So we start by creating a class. You name the class as you want. Now, there's an advanced 
Java programming, you can put many classes inside one file. Okay? You can have a class, and inside there's another subclasses, and all of that. But for this course, we're going to define only one class per file. So, for example, here is this is public class Hello World. The name of the file will be exactly match the name of the class. So, the name of the file is Hello World.java. And inside hello.word.java, there is only one class, public class hello world. Open the curly braces and close it. And inside this body, you can put whatever you like. Now, for this simple example, I just put a very standard method, public static void main, and take one argument, string argument, which is the array of a string. I understand some of you will not understand what is the strings data type, what is the array, what is args means. Let us postpone this discussion to answer it later on. But this public static void main is a standard one. If you see this method inside a class, you understand this is an executable class. You're going to come across some classes that you create in the lab, or maybe we create it here on the lectures, that is not executable. That means this class does not contain public static void main. So whenever I see a class contain public static void main with an argument string args, then array square brackets as an input argument, I understand this is an executable ar a class. I can execute it. And actually, in this example, very simple example, I have a class, public class, and it contains only one method, which is the public main. What is inside it? System.out.println, and I give a string. So I'm going to print out to the consoles, OK? I print hello world. Let us discuss this here on the slides, then we go to the demo. So, the first thing, don't forget the curly braces. Otherwise, you will have a problem, compile problem. The Android Studio will prevent you, you from executing. So open the curly braces and make sure you close it and don't forget the semicolon at the end of each statement. Now, this programming contains only one class, and this class is hello world. So that means it will be stored in one file what we call it a source file. So the source file, dot Java file, contains only one class. And the name of the file will be corresponding to the name of the class inside. So we create a class, hello world. And this class will be inside this file. So the file name is hello world Java, And the scope of this class is public scope. So any class can talk to our class, because we say it's public, public class. So that means everybody can communicate with our class. You can create a class as a private. So you can limit the scope of access to this class to a particular private, OK? Now, but most of the classes that we're going to create in this course are We add the method main. Then once we add a method main to the class, this class is an executable class. So we can execute it. Some classes that we're going to create does not contain main method. That means we're going to use this class either to run some methods or to create an object from this class. You don't need to change based on the design development, you determine which class that you're going to create will be public, and which class you, you create will be private. Okay? You're not changing it during the app. So once you declare the class, based on the requirement that you have, you receive the user requirement, you read all the requirements, you decide which method will be public, which method will be private, which class will be private, which class will be public. Okay? But for this course, most of the classes we're going to create are public classes. OK? 
For this course, you don't need. For this course, you don't need. Based on the design requirement, later on, maybe in 2030, you're going to see that you're going to have some classes like this. Okay? But most of the classes that we're going to come across is public class. You're going to see some methods. For example, it will become more clear for you. Some methods, we're going to declare it as a private method. So only within the class, you can access these methods not outside this class, okay? So once I have the main method, which is the strength signature of this method, public, static, void, main, string, and abbreviated by PVSM. Once you type this PVSM inside Android Studio, it will try to also complete the header for you. And here. So the main is visible for everyone. That's why it's public. And as you can see, we have only one method inside our class. It's a main method. And this method take one argument, which is the args, and of type of a string array. In Java, it's a case sensitive. So main, main with M capital or IAN capital is different method. So you have to be careful about declaring the method. Now, every Java will start with curly braces and end with curly braces. And we have only one statement, system.out.print line, hello world. And this will print hello world to the front. So if we look at that again to the class that we create, you can see this annotation here. It's a public class, hello world, is inside hello world.java. The name of the class is hello world. And there is only one method. It's called main method, public static void, with one argument of type of string array. And will it print only one message to the console. So there's only one sentence inside this. So let us switch to the Android So on this Android as you can see let me here Uh, on this app, as you can see, this is the Java folder. Inside it, there is a folder where we can create the classes. And the Java Android Studio has already created one class for us. It's called Zero Activity. So public class, Zero Activity, extend from app compact activity. This, we're going to keep it because once we run the app, we'll start executing this code on a create. Now, we can go back to the app, right click, and ask a new Java class to create a new class. And you can name the class. Then you specify to which package this class is belong. We're going to come across discussing the packages, how we organize our Java class. Then, as you can see, the class is created. I didn't put W as capital because this is a shortcut to stop the recording. So that's why I put W as small. This is a class, as you can see in the top, there is a package here, 
package and will declare this class belongs to which package, to which folder that this class that we're going to create is going to be stored in. And this file, hello world.java, will be stored on a specific location on the program, on the hard disk. I think we can go, yes, so yeah, you can see here, I hope it's visible. So this is the 01 app that we create. Inside it, you can see hello world.java, which is the, actually the, the file. You're going to take this file in some apps, and you're going to upload it using web submit. back to the, this class. Now you can ask public static void main and you can see it give you auto complete to complete the public static void and give you the header. Now once this class contains public static void main which means this class is executable. We can execute this class. We can add system dot out print line and we give an string. Don't forget you need to add a semicolon at the end. Now this class is created oh print line small You can go back, you can run from here, or you can run the app. You can run the main, hello.main, and you will wait for the Gwellers to build the app. Execution of this using Android should depend on your machine. Sometimes you will see this going fast, sometimes going slow, based on your machine. Whenever you develop an app, you need to link any app with the jar file. The jar file for this course is I2C, the jar file. You can see here, execution is finished, and the print message to the console is appeared, hello, ECS1023. Now, if you go back to the project view, you will see on the app there is a library which is i2c.jar. You can simply drag and drop the i2c jar to this location and right click to this one and you can add or link this to your code. Link this with the gradles and you can see on the gradles build the gradle here on this one you can see the dependency will be shown here on some place, I don't remember. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the belt, read it with belt, you can see that dependency is part of it is the ITC dot job to make sure it's successfully linked. Okay. Yes. Yes. Jar file will contains many ABIs are built by the author of this textbook, and you're gonna use this methods, okay, during development of the apps. 
and also there's some questions on the lab test will ask you to use it. So you need to know how to link the job file. So the job file contains some methods are developed by the author of this textbook. So it's good to link the job file to every app you create for this course. How to link the job file with your apps? Go to the previous lectures, there's steps. Read the textbook, there is also steps. How you link your job files, okay? Now, all what we discussed on the demo is here on the slide. As you can see, this is the main zero activity class that's created by the Android Studio for us to be able to allow us to run the app. And also, there is a package for each app. You will see that the app will sort out the Java file that you're gonna create for this app inside one package. And in this case will be ca.york.ecs.22.0. So when you see the package written like this, you should have, or you should understand that you have a folder called CA. Inside it, there is a folder called York. Inside it, there is a, another folder called ECS1022. Inside that folder, there is a zero folder where every class you create will be inside that folder. So, these are import messages generated by the Android Studio default. We're gonna write our import messages later on when we create our own class. So you can see that Android Studio try to import what we call a app compact activity packages and also Android OS bundles that this is necessary some files, some method we need from these packages to be executed. And this is the body of the inside the blue box is the body of this class. Now you can create a new class, new class and you give a name to this class, you specify to which folders or to which bucket. By default, these are things the same. It will sort out all the packages inside the same app. You can specify the visibility and the modifiers. In this case, it's public. There's no modifier, abstract, or final. We're not gonna create abstract and final classes, okay? And then, as you can see, the package is created, the name of the file is hello.java, and the class is public class hello. So inside this hello.java, there is only one class, and the name of this class is the same as the name of the file. And again, the class will be created inside the zero folders. So you can run this class, you create a main method, you can go right click to the class and run hello.main, this will print to the console hello. Now, if we back how the Java, any Java class organized in terms of files, you can see you have one or more files because each file will contain one class. So inside your app, you will have one or more files. Each file will be with the extension .java and also contains one class. The name of the file match the name of the class inside that file. You have zero or one package name. In the previous slide, as you can see, we have the package name. It's already provided. It's good to have the package name. Let's say someone decides to create a class without specifying the package name. Java understand that this programmer create this class without specifying the package. So it will take this class and put it on the default package. And this is very risky, because if you are developing an app and you create a class without any package, and you put this class on the default package, they might hackers can access this class, okay? It's good to organize your classes inside packages. And these packages are represent as a folders in your hard disk or inside your app. So you might have zero or one. You cannot have the, the class belong to more than one package, either zero or one. 
and you have zero or more in both statement. Sometimes you need some method from the jar file that is the author is created. So you need to import the jar file package inside the class that you create. Sometimes you don't need so zero or more import statement. You will have one class that is only one class inside this file, public class and you give the name. You have one or more fields, what we call it a class variable. And you have zero or more constructor. This constructor we're gonna come across over later on. It's responsible whenever you need to create an object. I create the class, I need to use this class, so I need to create an object from this class. I'm gonna reply or rely on the constructor. And we need zero or more methods. Some classes, they don't have a method. They're just containers of the data. Just create a class where it contains some attributes. You don't need method to manipulate. But normally, you'll have zero or more method which represent the behavior of these objects. For example, you create a, a class to represent a circle. What kind of attributes you need to add or a variable? If you need to create an object, a class to represent a circle, can anyone tell us what kind of attributes we need? A circle. If, any cir if anyone give you a circle, think about an object oriented. I give you a circle. What the first thing comes to your mind? The radius of the circle that I can use to calculate the area or circumference of the area. Is that right? So I can define a class, public class circle, and I can define a variable, which is the radius. I can add a method to calculate the area of the circle. So everything, let's say I told you, I'm going to define an object of table. What thing come to your class? to your mind about the table attributes or a probability or for the table. Yes, how many columns? Some tables with three, some tables with four. Yeah, what other thing? Rows. Yeah, color, the area, it's around or squares, rectangles, all this kind of attribute, we can add it to the object of type of class, public class tables, and we can add the color, the shape, columns, the area, all of this. And then we can create a method related to the tables, okay? If I told you the car, I'm gonna create an object of class of type car, public class car. What things come to your mind as an object of this car we should store about. Yes, make, models, years, colors, doors, all these kind of attributes. Think this is what is the Java is. It's an object oriented. So whenever you come across a problem, think about an object, okay? Now, someone will say, oh, nothing is an object, yes. Java give you this possibility to declare some classes where you cannot create an object from this class, but you can use this class to, to sort out some kind of method. Let's say we have a class called math. We cannot create an object of the math, but I can use cosine, sine, I can calculate the square root of any numbers. So the math is an object but I cannot create an, I mean a class, I cannot create an object from this class, but I can use some method of it, okay? So think about everything as an object oriented inside the Java. So in reality, and you're gonna see that on 2030, nothing is simple like the previous slide. We have actually static initialization block, non-static initialization block, we have a class inside the other class, we have a lambda expression that is introduced in Java 8. So to know more about this, you can go to this URL and you can know more about the Java organizations, about the class. Now, let us now focus on the package. When we say whenever we create a class, 
we create this class inside the package. So what is the package? The package is organized all the classes in one what we call the namespace. So it's like putting folder inside the category, inside directories. So you have directories and inside this directory you have another directory and inside the directory you have the Java. So a package is like a namespace contains names. So the package can be compressed onto a jar file. Why we need to compress the package on the jar file? Can anyone give us a hint? More smaller. Any other reason? Yes, easy to upload, transfer, share with others. Any other reason? We don't need any other people to modify it. You create the package. You make it as a jar file, as you said. It will reduce in size. It will be zipped. Okay? And also, it's easy to transfer and also easy to share with other programmers. But also, you have the privacy. No one can change your code. They can use it, but they cannot change it. You are the one who have a copyright to change. Okay? Most of the Java are shared with us as a jar file from Java Express. So, the packages can organize classes and interfaces. We're going to come later on about interface, what we mean by interface, and all the ABIs inside this class we can read and move. So whenever we say a package, we mean by that directory or a folder. A class, we mean by that a file. We can have sub-packages. As you can see, we have a Java and Lang and Utility and I.O., which is the sub-classes inside the Java. To be able to access subclass, you have to give a full qualified name of the subclass. So you have to provide java.lang or java.utility or java.io to be able to access this subclass. And also, you can have access to these classes inside the subclass by providing a full qualified name for the classes. You can say, I would like to use some method from javalang.string or javalang.method. So you provide a full qualified name for your class. So if you develop an app, you will decide to make everything .com, .example, .ecs, .10.22.pmi. That's on the app one. What do you think about this? If I told you this is the full qualified name for the package, so you're going to say, I will have ECS 1022 folders. Inside it, there is a BMI folder where inside this folder, all the classes for my app will be stored. As you can see here, this is the app structures. You will have the folder structures. They are aligned with each other. Okay? So you have the Java folders, and then you have COM folders example folder. Inside this folder, there is a BMI folder. Inside this BMI folder, we will have a file called BMI model. Good job. Any questions about the packages? And what we mean by packages? And why we need to use the packages? Okay. Now, once we create the package, we need to import this package. Let's say you create the package, contains some classes for your app. You need to share it with other people. You make it like a jar file, and you send it, and they, they need to use it. To be able to use this package, or you use one class inside your package, they have to provide an import statement. And the import statement should be in the top, after the package statement. So import, you give the package name dot star, means all the classes inside this package would be imported. But if you decide, I don't need to import everything. I just need the class, specific class. So you give a package name dot class. This means one package. Now, to be able to understand the import, we're going to come across what we call access modifiers. Access modifier, when we say, I'm going to declare my class as a public inside my package. That means it's visible for all other classes within this package or outside. So if you define a class and you say as a public class, 
inside your package and you share it with other people, they can use it because it's a public. And also, within the package, you can use it because it's a public. If you define a class as a private, It's a private class. It can be used within nested classes inside this class. Okay? And you cannot uh, only in the, in the current class. Okay? So you can have a public class. Inside this public class, there is a private class, but this will not be a scope for us. We're not going to put a nested classes inside each other. So this will be restricted for access within this class. Okay? But we're going to come across public method. Yes? No, you, there is a big point of public, private class. As a software engineer or software programmer or computer science or even electrical engineer, whatever, you need a private class. You create a public class, big public class, inside it you put sub-private classes. Only you can access these private classes inside. No one from outside you can access. But I told you, this is not a scope for us. We're not going to create nested classes. But there is a big point of creating a private classes inside a public class. Whenever you need to create an object and you need to hide this object from end users or from other developers, only you can access it within your public class. Okay? So there is a big point of privacy, copyrights, all of this restriction, encryption of your code, if you would like, you create a private class inside the public class, and you don't need anyone to access this class. A protected. It's visible within the subclass. Now, the concept of subclass, we're not going to cross over because this is related to the inheritance. But the concept, again, nested the class, we're not going to come across over. So in this course, everything is simple. Everything is simple. Most of the classes you're going to create is a public class. There is no nested classes. There is no subclasses. Okay? Default. This is the one where the someone create a class, say class, and give the name without specifying private or public or protected. That is dangerous for a programmer to use. That means you are putting it on the default access modifiers that visible within the current class and any type within the same package. Okay? Notes about import statement. Whenever you import something from a package, you import only the public thing. You cannot import the private classes. So, the classes which are not public, you cannot refer to it or you cannot use it. You cannot say, I would like to import all the classes within this package except this class. No way to do that. Either to import a specific class that you like or a package with all the classes inside it. You cannot say, I would like to import everything except one. There is no way to do this. Okay? And again, in both statement, there is no execution effect. There is no running time for import. So this will not affect your program. You say, oh, I have a very long list of import statements. So it might be my program will run slow compared to other students who have only one import statement. No. Import statement have no running time. Will not affect your executions. It's just saying, I'm going to work with these namespace. I'm going to work with some methods from other classes. Yes, but it, I think it's, it's some kind of Java offer an intelligent way of loading the appropriate class to the RAMs. OK? Good? It will not load everything. It will become very, very uh, obvious problem in the memory. For example, someone in board java.star would really be a problem, okay? But I think they will have a smart way of invoking the appropriate class by combining the code and see which really one you reference 
that's why which one you're going to link. Because in the process, that is not part of this. Whenever you compile the code, you generate a byte code, and there is a job for what we call it a linkers, who are going to do this kind of linking between the code. Okay, import statement must appear on the top. If I see someone put an import statement within the body of the method, this is a problem. It's a serious, major problem, okay? You cannot have import statement in the body. That's a restriction and it's, it's, a, it's a Java requirement. In, you put a package on the top, import statement in the second line, okay? So you cannot take the import statement and put it inside the body of the method. Okay. We discussed this. You see the package and you see the hello statement. So now you will say, oh, you are asking me to use math.max. Okay, math is, what is math? I don't have any import statement. Why? Should I have an import java.langs.math? If you are working with Eclipse, you should do that. But with Android Studio, because Android Studio is, is trying to link everything together, so the math, the standard library, is already integrated within the IDE. So I don't need to do that. If you go to 2030, you're going to work with Eclipse, you need to do that. The Eclipse will say, I don't understand what is the math is. So you have to put in the top here, after the package, import java.lang.either star or dot math. Math is a class. We cannot create object from math, but we can use method inside it. One of the methods is find the maximum between two numbers. We give two numbers to the max operation method. It will retain the maximum. It will print out the maximum here. Now, as you can see here, we have use utility dot great common divisor. What is the utility here? Utility is part, it's a class, part of the jar file, I2C, which is the jar file is created by the author of this textbook, and we have to link this jar file with all the apps we developed during the, this semester. So as you can see, I have to specify import ca.wahmani.itc dot utility, and we have a semicolon at the end. So I would like to use a utility class. Then I will have to inform that I need this one. And then I can use utility dot, and the IDE, the Android Studio, will give you a list of all the methods inside this utility. Again, utility is what we call a static class. A static class, you cannot create object from it. So utility, we can use some method inside it. And one of the method is great common divisor between two numbers, 24 and 18. So you see the import statements, okay? Because we need to use Wahmani utility class. And how we can use it? Utility dot, we specify dot, and then we see all the methods that we can use, and we pick up the great common divisor. Okay. Let me see if I have some time. Okay, now I will show you one thing. I will go back and will demonstrate to you. I'm not gonna start a new topic about the Java. Okay. Now, let's say, Now, most of you will see it like this. You're going to submit these files, XML file, hello.java file, string.xml, style.xml, zero.layout, and zeroactivity.java. 
these files, they are very small in terms of size. You're going to upload them on the web submit. Let's say I work at home. This, this is the scenario. I work at home. I developed the app at home, and everything was fine with me. Now I go to the lab. I would like to transfer my work to the lab machine so I can demonstrate to the TA that the app is working. It's very hard to transfer the old files with you. So we recommend you extract the necessary file that you modify or you create. For example, on this app, I modify something on the color.xml. I modify something. I create a new class, hello.java. I modify something on zero.layout. So I grab these files and put them either on the USB stick or submit them using web submit. Now I download them on the lab machines. Now in the hard disk on the lab machine, I would like to create the app again and show the TA. So I will go back here and close this app and create a new Android Studio app in front of you. I will call it 02. So this is the name of my app. And this is the company domain, which is the ECS 1022yourq.ca. And I don't need to have any C++ support or Kotlin support. Maybe when you would like to work with apps and you would like to use C++ classes or Kotlin classes, you would like to add this support. But right now, I don't need it. Next, I will specify the app ABI 15, which is the ice cream sandwich which will allow me when I finish the developing of this app, running it in the most of the Android devices. I can specify the TV or any other things, but now we don't need. I will create an empty activity. There's some information on the textbook where you have to select no activity. Okay? That will be where we are using developing the classes and we need to use the JUnit test or something like that. But anyway, most of the apps that you're going to start with on the lab, it's an empty activity. Then we click Next. It will give me a possibility to rename the activity. I will keep the thing the same. And I ask Finish. Now the Android Studio it will try to create the app for me. As you can see, the Griddle Builders will put the parameters and try to set everything set up for me. One of the things, and the first thing you have to do is go to the project structure. And go to the app, and go to the library. As you can see, there is no jar file link to my app right now. So I will go back to this standard files. By the way, still, Gradle is trying to finish the app. You can see this, but let me now this is the jar file that I need. I just drag it and drop it here. Now I have the jar inside the library file. If I look at the griddle, build the griddle, and I see the dependency, I will not be able to see here the dependency here, any kind of jar file dependency. I just go to the this one and ask link this another way, easy way actually, add as a library. Is from the app, okay? And as you can see, immediately Griddle is trying to link this jar file to the app. This is a shortcut, and the detailed steps already explained in the textbook, and also explained on the lecture notes number one. Now, if you look at the dependency, it's modified on this. So uh, now the uh, jar is linked. 
I go back to Android and I will go to the resources layout this is the layout very small okay anyway I will make it okay and as you can see this is the resources the XML file so I will just go to the XML file delete this one go back to these files I need to copy this is the XML file that I work at home it will contain all the user interface items setups components the names everything so I just go over this file and I copy all the contents within the main I would like you to see the design before I copy the design is empty I just go here and control V now all the design will be inside all the constraint that I create everything just copy and paste from the XML file to the XML file inside the project now I have a class I need to contain or class that I modify I go back to the project go to the Java here I need to create hello to Java inside hello to Java I have this code so I go back why I need to copy creating the class inside my app then copy paste because this app it has different file structures different packages organized inside it the name is not the same as the name the file the app that I create at home so I recommend to create new class then hello oh. finish now inside this class I can go back to the text file and copy everything I need here so as you can see this class this one okay now I would like you to see here I will make it I think I can make a view but I don't know anyway did you see this one utility here it's on the red utility dot great common divisor it's written on the red why do you think this is red we miss the import statement there is no import statement on the file so how we can do this there's either to go by hand do that or to let add the import statement for you you see here it's give you a hint how you can import that statement and they ask they cannot you can go here and say import ca dot mahmani dot itc and now you can either import everything inside this itc dot star or you pick whatever you like but during the development of the app on the lab you will have to use some classes here written by the author on this so I will put start semicolon as you can see now everything is fixed even I have a method called find factorials I'm gonna discuss this next lectures okay and now you can run your main method I'm not running the app I'm just running the main class if I would like to run oh, I have some maybe errors check the log file then I think I have to do make projects this will make everything together I think I have a problem now yes you see here the problem is I didn't bring the string dot XML I used the label of the buttons using a string dot XML 
and I need a book here at string as eight. So I'm going to go to the resources file, values folder. Inside it, there is an XML file where I'm going to do the translation. So it's good to go now to that and update. So here in the resources, values, you will have the string.xml. As you can see, this is the current string.xml. In my code, I change this. I use this resources. So I will take all of these. I also use the style. I define a new styles. When you define a new style, it make it easy for you to take this style and apply it for any user interface item inside your app. So you don't need to go to one by one user interface item and change the color or thing. You just specify the style and then this style will make the text color as a red and the background as a blue. Another thing that I did on the app, I think I used the um, colors. This is the colors that I specify putting the name of these colors. Let me see them. I don't think I changed anything here. No, I didn't change anything. Okay, so I think now my app is can be built correctly. I can make the projects. Here, you can see it's making the project, it's running the project. Now you can go back to Hello World and run. As you can see, it's running successfully. If you would like to run the app, you go to here to the app, change the environment configurations, and run the app, and then you specify which virtual Android device. I don't have a real device connected to this laptop, so I'm going to run it on the virtual device. Now, there is something I would like you to know, but let me finish this one. You develop the app, you did some modifications, and you run the app. You ask the Android Studio to run the app. Now, keep this running. Because every time you ask the Android Studio to run the app, it will take too much time to finalize. This is OK, because it connected the projectors to this one. OK, it's trying to run the Android device, loading the Android operating system, all this. Let's say, keep this running. Go back to the app. You did some modification. And you need just to run these modifications. You can do that. I will show you. This is very slow for some machines. See, Android is starting right now. You can make this bigger if you like. This is actually, you can simulate this simulate actually the Android device. Any Android, you can see it here. It's now going to try to still running. After it's running the Android virtual device, running the Android operating system, it's trying to install the app uh, a, that you develop on this machine. Now it's installing APK, it's Android package. After finishing the installation, it will run. So these are the process of running the app. So, okay. So this is the app, and these are the buttons. Okay. Now let's say I'm gonna go leave this running. I'm gonna go back to XML. I will try 
to change the background of this or the color of this. Let us say I would put it I change the background to purples. Now, I just need to run this modification. You see here, this is the lightning next to the run. There is a lightning icons, it's very hard maybe to see, next to the run. When you click to that lightning here, you will be able to just run the differences. So, you do not need to again run the app from scratch. You just ask the Android Studio to rebuild your app and run the differences. It is supposed to be faster than start the process from scratch to run the app. See? This is just running the differences. So, I hope now all of you understand how you can create the apps and how you can create the first class, okay, uh, and how you can transfer the information from your machine that you work at home to the lab. You just need to transfer Java file, XML files in the app one. In the app one, you're going to create a class, BMI class. The labs will start today. Next lecture, we're going to discuss more about data types and object oriented, how we can create class. Okay? Yeah, let me just sort out these things. And uh, I, I, because I don't need to forget anything, because something I need to submit and right. analyze.